This video will explain self-damaging contrastive learning. This paper is building off of a very exciting paper titled, What do compressed deep neural networks forget? We've seen the success of pruning where we take a dense neural network and prune away some of the weights, set them to zero, and somehow it retains the same accuracy. Basically, it'll drop off from say 80% to 77% with say uh, extreme sparsity levels like 10%, 5%, and this model pruning is still able to retain the overall same accuracy. But this paper is exploring that 3%. What exactly is changing in the uh, prediction, the metrics as you're pruning these models? So these are the contributions uh, listed in this paper, what to compress deep neural networks forget. The first of which, top line metrics such as top one or top five test set accuracy hide critical details in the ways that pruning impacts model generalization. So even though we're saying it's only fallen off 3%, uh, there are critical details like, say, confusion matrix, matrix analysis and these kind of things. Certain parts of the data distribution are far more sensitive to varying the number of weights in a network and bear the brunt cost of varying the weight representation. The examples most impacted by pruning, which we term pruning identified exemplars, are more challenging for both models and humans to classify. We conduct a human study and find that PIEs, the pruning identified exemplars, tend to be mislabeled of lower quality, uh, depict multiple objects, or require fine grained classification. And so here's the idea, compression impairs model ability to predict accurately on the long tail of less frequent instances. So this is a very interesting idea with self-supervised learning, these less frequent instances. We don't have a balanced class distribution when we're scraping this unlabeled data from the internet or wherever it is. So we have to think about uh, these insights about how compression impacts these different instances. So finally, compressed networks are far more brittle than non-compressed models to small changes in the distribution that humans are robust to. This sensitivity is amplified at higher levels of compression. This showing further that um, these compressed networks don't do, say, uh, distribution shift as well as the full model. But here's the key insight for self-damaging contrastive learning is that the compressed models, they fail with the long tail of less frequent instances or class imbalance minority examples in these data sets. So again, the long tail of self-supervised learning in this image from divide and contrast, self-supervised learning from uncurated data, another algorithm that's addressing this problem of locally relevant subsets for contrastive learning and accounting for long tail objects that don't appear very frequently in this massive data set. Say you have a data set of a billion images and some super specific uh, dog breed or I don't know, whatever object you can imagine only appears five times in this massive data set or, you know, some distribution like that. That's the idea that we have these objects at the tail end of our like frequency plies, probably power law distributed. And then we need to still learn a representation for these objects in our self-supervised learning objective. So here's the idea behind self-damaging contrastive learning, drawing insights from what do compressed neural networks forget. And that being the long tail samples are poorly memorized. These things that appear very rarely say this is some specific uh, beer or something like that, or maybe this is a crossword puzzler. This idea of these objects that appear very rarely in these massive unlabeled data sets. So the idea is in contrastive learning frameworks, usually what we have is say bootstrap your own latent, we take an image, apply it to two different data augmentation transformations, and then we try to maximize the similarity between these two representations through say a target model. And then usually what we have in bootstrap your own latent is a momentum encoder running average of this target or otherwise known as in the online network. In this case, what we're doing is we have our target model and then we have the pruned sparse model. So this pruned sparse model, say this is 5%, 10% sparsity with respect to zeroing, zeroing out the weights or you could uh, zero out entire structural paths, the difference between say weight pruning and structural pruning. But we prune this network and then we enforce the consistency on these two representations and this is a way of doing this hard negative mining towards these long tail samples because as it is pruned and it forgets the representations for the long tailed samples, it's going to have uh, some say random representation for that class or, you know, different from its original representation. So this will contribute the most to the gradient update as we're learning these representations from unlabeled data. And it's a very interesting idea, low overhead. Well, you have to compute this pruning, but things like iterative magnitude pruning, it isn't too much of a bottleneck and it can improve the performance as we'll see with the results in the paper. So again, just as a quick reminder, the comparison between the self damaging contrastive learning is we're pruning the network compared to bootstrap your own latent where the target network is a running average of the weights of the online network. So say we have this uh, tau hyperparameter that is the weighting between the previous step and then the new update to the theta parameters as they get the gradient updates during training. This isn't uh, the target network isn't a running average of this network. It's the pruned version of this network. And that's the idea of this algorithm. So as we dig through the results of the experiments to see how much this algorithm really contributes to this heavy tail distribution, we're going to be simulating uh, heavy tail distribution. So taking the CIFAR 10, CIFAR 100, and the ImageNet data sets, uh, the authors are going to artificially construct 
power law distributions for the uh, class label frequency, and then bucket the evaluation into the levels of imbalance. So many, medium, few, these are the percentiles of, so 33 of the classes. So CIFAR 100 has 100, 100 classes like airplane, dog, bird, uh, tree, I don't know if trees in there, but things like that. And so you have, you've uh, artificially sampled it so that the top 33% has between 106 to 500 instances in the class, 105 to 20, and then 19 to five. And this is a common practice when studying class imbalance to artificially sample the data set to simulate the problem and then study in this control setting where say you could compare it to an Oracle baseline where you have all of the labels. And so on, this helps for this experimental practice of studying this uh, how much this heavy tail distribution would account for uh, real, world, real world distributions, but uh, in a controlled setting. So this first table is showing the performance difference between the balanced subset, the Oracle ground truth, where, or the Oracle where you have completely balanced data, the same distribution of class labels in each of the different classes, compared with this artificially uh, long tailed subset, D sub I. So notably is the CIFAR 100 uh, results table. You see in the many case, when you've sampled it so that many is most of the distribution and then medium few, the model has overfitted to the many case. It's biased towards predicting the majority instances as in the class imbalance problem. So you see it performs better than the balance set on these many classes when you've sampled it this way. And then as you get to few, it, perf it performs worse. And interestingly, it overall performs better, showing that these accuracy metrics can be uh, deceiving with respect to evaluating these models in the presence of class imbalance. And this is these uh, representations are trained with contrastive learning, not uh, self-supervised uh, learning. So there, these representations are learned on these subsets of data after they've been, uh, you know, sampled with these uh, data sets or trained with these data sets, and then they have this linear evaluation layer on these representations. So these aren't the super, this isn't the supervised learning performance when evaluated with these labels and fitting these labels. This is the representation that's learned from contrastive learning, showing that contrastive learning is biased towards class imbalance similarly to supervised learning, as you see the difference between many and then few. These are the results with few shot supervised fine tuning. So you take the representation that was learned from uh, contrast of learning with each of these uh, subsets, and then you have a few shot fine tuning. So it has a few examples from each of the many, medium, and few uh, subsets, and then you see the performance when you fine tune it. So we see the gap increases even further when you do this additional supervised fine tuning compared with the many and few uh, subsets. So again, this table is telling the same story. We have the balanced subsets. We have different types of artificial long tail construction, Pareto distribution, uh, exponential distribution. You can look at the paper to get more details about that. Two different ways of sampling uh, the long tail and the distribution of how many classes are in each of the few, medium, and many uh, buckets. We see the difference in linear separability where the many to few isn't uh, so bad, but then once we have the few shot adaptation, so once we take the representation and then fine tune it and adapt it to a new task, the, uh, the difference between many and few increases even further. So those three tables shown above were motivating this problem, comparing the performance difference between balanced and then long tail uh, sample data sets. Now we're seeing the uh, proposed solution, self-damaging contrastive learning and how it improves over SimCLR. So SimCLR is what's uh, being demonstrated in these uh, tables. SimCLR is a contrastive learning algorithm that learns a representation from each of these artificially constructed uh, data subsets. So we see uh, the self-damaging contrastive learning improving on CIFAR 10 long tail on many, medium, and few, whereas we see this uh, degradation, we see degradation in both cases, but it's improving over SimCLR and it seems to also be learning uh, generally a better representation. And this is a bit of a surprising uh, gain as well. But anyway, so we also see the ImageNet performance uh, about more steady with the SDCLR. Uh, not too dramatic, but still an interesting improvement and an interesting algorithmic solution. So uh, again, this is the 69.54 reported in this uh, real results from this uh, Pareto long tail type ImageNet 100 classes and then this artificially constructed uh, data set split. Okay, so here is the really exciting result where they prove that what they're intuitively motivating the problem and then demonstrating that the SDCLR has a big benefit over SimClear. So this is the performance in the few shot setting you see in the ImageNet 100 long tail setting, about the same performance on the majority classes, but then once you have this minority example, the self-damaging contrastive learning algorithm with the pruning and this kind of hard negative mining does perform better than the SimCLR algorithm. So this figure is showing a pretty interesting analysis of how the, these uh, representations are forgotten during pruning throughout training. So on the x-axis is the training schedule. So we go 250, 500, up to 2,000 epochs as we're going through the training set. And this percentage is the uh, percentage of these uh, 
class labels that when you measure the cosine similarity of the features, they have a high enough uh, dissimilarity to meet this percentage threshold. So uh, say in this particular setting, the medium classes, they had a high uh, distance between their features as measured by cosine similarity. So you see throughout training how the many, uh, many where this is where most of the uh, data is, is pretty low with respect to the disagreement because it's overfitting to the majority examples. And then interestingly is that the medium where say you have uh, again, like uh, 20 to 50 of these examples compared to 5 to 19 and then compared to 106 to 500 is mostly uh, forgotten. So it's an interesting analysis of the curves of how this behaves over training. And maybe these kind, this kind of study will lead to further insights and further algorithmic development. So if you're interested in the exact experimental procedure they use with the pruning ratio, this is showing uh, going from 70% sparsity up to 99% sparsity, how much the performance uh, drops off with linear separability and then the few shot fine tuning. And they uh, de describe some more analysis of their experiments, like the distribution of sparsity throughout uh, this convolutional network architecture, how many weights are pr uh, pruned in each of the different uh, layers with respect to how you design this, and some of the details about uh, looking at the representations throughout the pruning and really trying to understand what's happening with the long tail distribution in this self-damaging contrastive learning and particularly this idea of what do compressed neural networks forget. Here's another interesting results table presented in the paper. This is the visualization of the attention, the most salient uh, features with respect to the grad cam uh, interpretability technique. And this is uh, demonstrated on the Keras code examples if you want to play around at the grad cam yourself showing that the SDCLR is focusing more on the uh, relevant areas of the images compared to the representations learned with SimCLR. So this is an interesting way of uh, probing for these representations and doing this kind of uh, gradient analysis with the grad cam algorithm. So to wrap things up, this self-damaging for contrastive learning algorithm is a very interesting idea of using this pruning idea to probe for this hard negative mining and a very interesting insight into this behavior of contrastive learning and forgetting with respect to uh, the biases of majority examples in these unlabeled data sets, as well as this class imbalance problem that we've seen in supervised learning. I think another interesting paper, kind of in this idea of these algorithmic solutions to this kind of SGD bias towards simple solutions and so on, evading the simplicity bias, training a diverse set of models, discovers solutions with superior out of distribution generalization. The idea of this paper is that you have all these different classifiers that you train. So say you have an ensemble of 10 different classifiers, and then you're gonna have a diversity loss. So you want uh, each of these classification models to focus on different patterns in the data to enforce the diversity and uh, learn, hopefully in this case, more robust uh, generalizations, abstractions of the data, features, representations, so on, such that you can have better generalization. So I think it's another interesting case where it's like this algorithmic idea, this slight change of the architecture that has this very interesting kind of motivation, similar to this idea of pruning, in my view, of this way of enforcing this bias on understanding that these models are going to be biased towards easy solutions in the SGD optimizations uh, idea, as well as the majority ca cases in a uh, class imbalance. Thank you so much for watching this overview of self-damaging contrastive learning. I thought this was a really interesting algorithm, and I hope it helps you thinking about self-supervised and contrastive learning and heavy tail distributions of unlabeled data and some potential solutions to overcome this, this very interesting idea of uh, exploiting this paper of what do compressed uh, neural networks forget and utilizing it in this contrastive learning framework for hard negative mining, I think is a very interesting idea, and particularly negative mining of this long tail uh, sample. So if you have anything that uh, you think I made a mistake in the video, or if you have a question, please leave it in the comments. And please subscribe to Henry AI Labs for more deep learning and AI videos.